Good evening and welcome to On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. With a population of over 300 million and a GDP of about 240 billion US dollars, the East African community is a regional bloc with immense economic potential. The community that started with three states has now grown to seven, with the Democratic Republic of Congo being the latest entrant. The EAC that is headquartered in Arusha now stretches from the Konyan coast on the Indian Ocean to Congo Kinshasa on the Atlantic. But is this regional bloc people-centered? Where is the monetary union that was promised decades ago? And when will the political federation become a reality? To answer all these and more, we are honored tonight to host the EAC Secretary General, Honorable Dr. Peter Mathuki. invitation it's an honor to host you here in Uganda and particularly here on NTV thank you very much you know Uganda is home yes I'm Pala, when I'm here I feel um, quite at home yeah. um, and I'm feeling at home but um, on a uh, first and foremost let me give my condolences to the government and the people of Uganda upon the losing of the one of the members of the cabinet Charles Okello who passed on last week we did send our condolence, but again, now that I'm here physically, please uh, let the government and the people of Uganda accept the condolence, our deepest condolences as East African community. But otherwise, I'm at home. Thank you. You know, it has been two years since yeah. you were at the helm of the East yeah, African correct, community as correct, Secretary General. Correct. How is it going? Um, we are doing our level best. I'm, um, I'm enjoying serving the people. It's a, it's a service job. It's a job of serving the people of East Africa, looking <coughs> at the, how the treaty says is people-centered and our work at the secretariat is to implement decisions of the summit of the council and ensure that uh, the people of east africa feel that indeed this is their community and that's why every time we come around and move around to all the partner states we feel um, indeed obliged to explain to the people of east africa the state of their community now that talking about the people Actually, it's the question I had. Yeah. Is, is this block people-centered? And that's what I mean. If, if I went to Nyahuru in Kenya yes. and talked to the local people, yes. or came to northern Uganda in Chawente, or mm. went to Rwanda in Ruhenjeri, mm. or in Bagamoyo in Tanzania, or mm. Kalemi in Congo, or in Chibitoke in Rwanda, mm. in, in, in Burundi, mm. would I find those local manainchi of East Africa, of Africa Mashariki, really understanding what this is all about. You see, looking at the framework of the East African community, the architecture of the East African community, it is, um, it is actually done in four major pillars. And looking at the pillars that uh, make the EAC integration, that is the customs union being the first pillar, the, the common market being the second pillar, the monetary union being the third pillar, and political federation being the fourth pillar. If you look at the architecture of these pillars, they are all people-centered. They are people-centered because when you are talking of the customs union, you are talking of movement of goods from one partner to, to another. And when you talk of goods, you are talking about welfare. You are talking about these goods being moved from one country to another by people. These goods are coming from the farms, from factories, from companies that are being managed by and run by, by the people of East Africa. And therefore, the more we increase the movement of goods from one country to another, the more we do intra-ESA trade, the more East Africans interact, and the, way, the more people feel Indeed, they belong to this region. You know, the movement of goods and the movement of uh, services has, has been happening even before. It was happening even for the EAC. Yeah. But let me give you the, the latest headache. Yeah. And the latest headache is coming from our brothers yes. in Kenya. Yeah. Because there was a time uh, about two, three, four weeks ago yes. when the Kenyans were like, no, we don't want K Ugandan milk in our market. Y yes. And before that, the problem was about sugar. Mm. So if the Kenyan brothers do not want us to trade with them, mm -hmm. which is the essential part of the East African community mm. then perhaps they don't get it and I can assure you looking at the treaty itself it says is a market driven yeah. it's a market driven uh, community which is people centered all that we do we do for the welfare of the people but aware that is market driven meaning whoever is bringing their product and their goods in the market at a cheaper rate then you take it and therefore if you are producing your product your milk or you are whatever it is that you're producing within East Africa, you are supposed to enjoy and sell within East Africa. And therefore, if it's a section of a few people, 
in um, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in business who are trying possibly to want you to compete. It is not all Kenyans. I'm sure if you bring your you milk know, there was a letter I think from the Kenyan Diary Association yeah. who said stop the importation of Ugandan milk into the Kenyan market. And you know what that means? That means that milk will find the the, ma the same market using other other routes, which means the same product that you are saying you are, you are you are preventing from coming into the market. Those traders in Uganda will find other ways of ensuring that the, the 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 product goes into the market either through the informal routes, and that is the reality. Because what East African wants, they want to buy a product that is competitive. Why would you want to buy a product that is more expensive and yet you can get a quality product of the same at a cheaper rate? So that's why I'm you sure, see. I'm sure when you are seated in a Russia, yeah, uh, that must have been your headache as well. And, and indeed, and uh, our 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 position is to keep as, as, as custodians of the law and regulations. We keep on reminding partner states, and indeed all the stakeholders and players, that they must play, understand the game, and the game is that market-driven community. And it therefore, it appears, uh, Mr. Secretary General, yeah. that Kenya has not yet worked, uh, um, you know reach the reality that, that the Ugandan manufacturers and Ugandan industries well, are no longer taking baby steps. They are here to compete. And, 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 and I think that is strange to them. No, and that is the essence of our community, competitiveness and market driven. So therefore, if now a business person can produce cheaper in Uganda, you should be able to access the 300 million people market in the region. And that is the reason why we are talking of expansion. We are, why are we expanding to 300 million people? We are expanding so that we can get enough market for products. If you have some enough cows and you are producing enough milk or you, have, uh, you are producing eggs, you should be able to sell within the market of 300 million people without any impediment. And we keep on reminding our business as secretariat is to keep on reminding East Africans. And therefore, East Africans should know this is a market open for them. And therefore, when there are issues like that, it becomes our business as East African Community Secretary. But also, there could be another reality that one country can have competitive advantage in producing something, and, that and, is and, then, and then another country doesn't have. And, and, and sometimes, a government may be forced to protect its own industry and protect their own farmers. And that is why what we say is a market-driven uh, region. It's a market-driven economy. When you talk of comparative and competitive advantage, you are saying, if you are good in this particular product, let you be allowed to produce for the market. And if the other person is good in this, produce and you compete in the market. And who is going to determine this? It is the people, the consumers. And that's why we call it market driven. So, uh, by the way, it's the, the Kenyan milk, uh, Ugandan milk into yeah. Kenya having a pr problem also came on the heels of Ugandan sugar. <laughs> you I, remember I, that? And you see, let me tell you something that uh, people should know. It doesn't matter. You'd rather get your product from within East Africa than get outside East Africa. Because what you are doing, if you get outside East Africa, and yet you are rejecting the ones from the East Africa, you are killing jobs. You are killing the economies of East Africa. And therefore, it's also about sensitization of people to know that indeed is their right to buy things and even keep on promoting what we call produce East Africa, buy East Africa. And that is what we should be promoting that indeed if you are producing from East Africa, why are we expanding? Why are we increasing so many countries? It's markets. Why are we increasing markets to produce? And therefore, if we cannot produce enough, why are we ex why looking you know, for markets? You know, uh, uh, Honorable Mothuki, you know what was disturbing, yeah. but maybe they had a right. The Kenyan Parliamentary Committee had to come to investigate that actually this milk that is coming from Uganda, is, act is it actually Ugandan milk? But of course when they came, they found it is Ugandan. It, it so they have not uh, woken to the reality th that Uganda can produce this much of this quality and this quantity. Uh, and, and, yeah, I know. And I know maybe and I, now they know. And I can assure you one thing. Um, citizens and the people are getting to know the reality. They are getting to know. They are getting to know their community better. And I'm sure going forward, you are going to see some changing dynamics in that we do business. Okay. And that is why you, you, you. Whenever we receive those kind of complaints, 
we try to communicate with all the partner states and say, hey, remember, this is a community, and it's a community which is market-driven and for the people. And all that we do, we must be ready to do for the people of East Africa. And therefore, going forward, let us do, but we'll be happy to receive feedback that uh, informs on what is happening. And this is quite positive. But I agree with you, there's been a number of distortions. And, you know, try to, uh, some group of people trying to create some sort of, uh, you know, barriers. Uh, to trade, others wanting to say protect us. Why would you be, want to be protected? Why, if it's a market, why can't you produce better quality and also give the better price? So and automatically the people of East Africa will buy what you are selling. All right, why would I, you want protection? But uh, the partner states, yeah. uh, you know, the political leaders, yeah. are really reading from the same hymn book mm -hmm. when it comes to the uh, Project East Africa. Mm -hmm. Because it looks like some countries are still dragging their feet and uh, other countries are ahead of them. Is there a problem for everybody among the political elite to embrace the community? You no, know, I, what I would say is that um, the community being uh, people-centered, it is, of course, a responsibility of all governments and, of course, ourselves and even the private sector to create awareness among the, among, among the citizens, leave alone the political class. And again, you also remember the political class, some of them, Again, there could be also interest, there could be also business people, ETC. So what is of importance is for people to know their rights within the community, that this community belongs to them. And if you are coming to invest or you want to do business in South Africa, you have a right to access the market of 300 million people. And that's why I was saying, for the last two years, looking at the intra ESC trade, trade within East Africa, in 2022, we did business within East Africa uh, to the tune of 10.9 billion US dollars. And now with the inclusion of DRC recently, now that has expanded to around 11.9 billion US dollars. That accounts for 16% of the global trade. So we are not doing so badly within East Africa. And we must appreciate much as of course there are challenges to do with, um, with non-tariff barriers that keep on now coming in. We must appreciate that some progress and things are happening, but appreciate the fact that governments are also providing conducive environment for investment, but also the private, private sector dynamism is also contributing. They seem to be understanding, appreciating that this expanded market is making sense to them. And that's why we, 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 I must uh, confess from where I'm seated as Secretary General that the customs union, which is the first pillar, seems to be working. Because if the measure is the intra-trade, ESE trade, and it is increasing, I'll be very much worried if the intra-ESE trade was declining. However, there are the issues that you have just mentioned, which we keep on addressing, but also sensitizing and encouraging investors to come and invest and access this market of 300 million people. So now you talked about the, the, the pillars of customs union, and common, then, and common then market, market, and monetary union, and, and political and, and, federation. And, and, yes, let, 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 let me ask this, yes. because... Uh, it was envisaged mm -hmm. that by now, yeah. by now, mm -hmm. would be in a political federation. In fact, the, the, the monetary union should have happened in like in 2012 or 2013, 2014. We should even have been in a political federation. What happened? Uh, and uh, that now is coming to the second pillar, which is the common market protocol, and that talks about movement of people, services, capital, and goods from one partnership to another. As we speak today, if you are coming from Uganda going to Rwanda, or from Kenya to Rwanda, or from Kenya to Uganda. You don't need a passport. You need to use your national ID. If you just use your national ID, you can travel. And the essence of this was to facilitate free movement of people across, so that people you don't have to buy, have a passport for you to travel from one partner to another. We are looking to a situation where we'll be going to a borderless East Africa. And this is, these are some of the measures that are making, making us feel comfortable that indeed people are are able to move. However, what I'm, what I'm able, even tourist visa, for example, if you want to get a tourist visa, you're in the United States, you want to get a visa to come to Uganda. You send the same visa, you use the same visa to go to Rwanda, you use the same visa to come to Kenya, ETC, and other countries you are trying to onboard them so that it becomes very easy. So I must confess that yes, there's some progress that has been done, however we could do better. The third pillar, which is the monetary union, we are talking of now a common currency. It was foreseen that, initially foreseen that we are supposed to have a common currency 2023, 2024. And there's been a lot of pressure from the business community, even for the people, that as we increase movement and do business, we wouldn't want to move with the currency of East Africa. As we speak, now we are in the process of identifying 
what we call the East African Monetary Institute and where it's supposed to be hosted. And the idea of uh, hosting this is it creates a roadmap of when we can have this currency. Of course, the experts and the governors of central bank and, uh, banks have been meeting to identify and see how to harmonize the physical and monetary policies within the region. But my suggestion has been, and I've been talking to some of them, because they do what is happening in West Africa. West Africa, they have a CEFA, and then they have their national currencies. Could we have our national currencies run, run concurrent with the <coughs> regional currency and see how it goes and put it into a practice and see? If, for example, you are able to move from here to Tanzania with the regional currency you use, and then we see how it goes. But there's been a lot of uh, carefulness and, you know, being... Uh, uh, sensitive because again handling financial matters is not easy. Remember there was economic collapse in uh, Europe at some point yes. and therefore I think uh, our experts are being also very careful so that they don't dive our economies into a mess but we've been challenging them that even with the digital currency that is coming and all this could they find a way of having a regional currency and this is something a conversation will continue pushing to them as experts and we challenge them so that instead of having a currency in the next five years we should be having a currency in the next three years and from where i sit i think it is very possible third pillar which is the, poli the fourth, fourth pillar, pillar which is now political confederation we've been um, in this in the summit that was done in 2018 they agreed that the fourth pillar being a political federation we could now come and have a transition which is political confederation we have a constitution and get views from the people of east africa how do they want the community to look like and we have that collected views from a number of countries we did pick views from the republic of burundi we came here to uganda and we picked their views and now they want the constitution uh, to look like as we speak uh, two days ag ago i launched this uh, public participation and consultations in the Republic of Kenya. We are now there getting views. And then, of course, in the next month, we'll be going to Tanzania. And the end of the year, we go to Rwanda. And then, of course, uh, South Sudan and DRC do towards the beginning of the year. So once we get this, we make a report and see how do East Africans feel about political confederation. My feeling is this. The people are already ahead of all of us. People want to move forward. And I think most of these problems we are facing could be solved if we resolve the issues of political confederation. And I think that is the way to go. You go to the United States, when you are moving from one partner state to another, you don't even realize you are moving. And that is, uh, those are 52, 53 states. Yes. So it becomes easy for us to manage our affairs when we are one team. And I tell you here, if we want to succeed as East Africa, the bigger the regional economy block, the better. We need to, I'm looking at a situation where uh, matches, of course, now DRC has joined the seventh member. Soon we are looking at the admission of Somalia. And if possible, we start now pursuing and discussing with Ethiopia. And even Sudan itself, because they had applied even earlier. See how we can Sudan have had Sudan. applied to enter the Yes, East they had even uh, applied earlier at that particular time, but because uh, one of the criteria was you need to be next or neighboring a partner state or a partner. So at that time, there was no country that was neighboring Sudan. But South Sudan has since joined. So the, that criteria now, Sudan qualifies. The idea is, how can we have our regional economic block of 500 million people? Because that way, the reason why you see United States getting respected is because of numbers. Look at Russia, numbers. Look at China, it's numbers. India is numbers. So the bigger the number, the market it is, the more we get respected, both but in the global the, what, scene, what but also do, in our markets. What are you going to do for the mutual suspicion amongst the leaders of East Africa? Uh, suspicion is one thing, but uh, look, let's look at the bigger picture. Suspicion, even at the family level, even at the house level, when you have your son or your daughter, or maybe your wife, they will suspect one thing. But that does not mean you don't run your home. We should look beyond those suspicions, do things correct, and move. Once we drive, I'm sure, uh, it becomes uh, easier to resolve. You know, Suspicions uh, we, will we, always we know be there. We, we are almost running some kind of a democratic experiment in the region. Yeah. We can say that Tanzania has solved its democratic uh, experiment and they are running. We yeah. can say Kenya has almost gotten there. Yeah. And, 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 and Uganda is yet to start even. Yes. And, and other countries which have, that have joined, some of them have come with their toxic you know, divisions that mm. in the Congo with all respect and, and, and in the South Sudan. That is an impediment. And I can tell you any part of the world 
all countries in the world have started up their own issues. We must agree that within East Africa, and the trade is very clear in how we terms we, we handle matters of governance, we are doing very well. In Africa, actually, East African community is the most integrated and respected regional economic bloc. When you talk of East African community integration, we have the best. We have the best champions. We have the President Museveni, who is our champion of regional integration. We are lucky as East Africa to have people who drive and understand this and who are trying to tell us this is the way to go. I want My to thinking is that we need to take advantage I want to believe, of people Dr. like Dr. Matoki, yes. that President Yoweri Museveni mm. is more or less ahead of the park um, among his group, the peers, for those who are the proponents of the East African Community Federation. Mm. But the others seem to be dragging their feet. The others seem to be, you know, wait a moment. And, yeah. and, and, and for him, he's like, it should have happened yesterday. Yeah, you know, His Excellency Museveni is our, is, a, is a gold that we have in our hands that possibly people don't uh, seem to understand. Are you saying this that, because uh, you're in Kampala? No, <laughs> that is something that I believe in. And uh, I believe in this because um, he's one of the people I've admired and who inspired me to to love integration because he means it. He, s he speaks about it. He says, the only way you can become competitive and secure is if you are strong. But if you are weak, you'll be interrupted. And that is common sense. And therefore, that's what I, I keep on saying. He keeps on reminding all of us. He, keep, uh, he keeps on reminding um, everyone, every leader. And therefore, I think uh, I want to urge him that he should not tire. He should continue mentoring uh, all the leaders across the board. But even coming to Uganda, every time you come to Uganda, and you go to the streets and listen. People have a better understanding of the East African community than even m most of the What, what I can actually tell you that is very common and now that's rooted yeah. among the young generation, yeah. uh, 10 years and below. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you go to a remote village, yeah. somewhere in a school uh, in Uganda, you yeah. would hear children singing the East African community anthem with a lot of zeal. What does that I, tell I mean, you? That is beautiful to hear. What does that tell they you? They may not understand the Kiswahili, yeah. but at least we have a clean state to begin with. A what, clean does, slate to begin what does with. that tell you? It means the policy. Uh, is clear in Uganda and that starts with the leadership and that's what I'm saying we need to have many people doing that so looking at the first East African community people are a bit aware more than it we have the current so we need to have everybody on board to understand the community the East African community and how it benefits them and the first thing is what we get 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 uh, always be reminded by our leaders once we be we come together one is a market if you are producing any small products, this bottle of water in Kampala, you are able to have an access of 300 million people. That is that's common sense. And therefore, even in the global arena, when you are strong, you are so many, you are able to speak in one voice, you get respected. And these are some of the things we get from our leaders. So President Museveni has been singing these things to all of us. It's not because I'm in your Kampala today, but it's, this is something I'll well, always, so, by the way, and so, I will always be so happy to close. So, so, so the new listen. entrant yes. that has uh, stretched the reach of East Africa from yeah. the Indian coast to the to in, in an ocean to the Atlantic yeah. is the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm. And, but the DRC has its own problems. Yeah. And, and the DRC, if, if uh, President Felix Sesekedi was quoted right, the other day he was saying the East African standby for brigade that had gone to pacify uh, areas of South Kivu and, 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 and North Kivu should actually leave. It appears Congo could bring problems for the East African region. No, I don't, uh, I don't think so. Look at this. And even at, I ask this, even at family level, when you have a family, you'll always one or small quarrels in the house. That does not mean the house is breaking. It means that actually when you speak your mind, then you are able to understand that you move forward better. I think the vision of expanding our East African community and admitting as many members as possible, it will put us, it put us in a very advantaged position as Look, East African uh, community. President Sesekedi, yeah. Dr. Masoki, mm. President Sesekedi is mm. telling the East African Brigade, get regional out, force, get, yeah. get out. Yeah, is the East regional, African is, regional force, is the regional get out. Look at this. When He's uh, telling them, get out. When the, re, when, the East Af when the DRC was admitted into the East African community, and that was last year, a decision was made by the heads of states that it should be a collective responsibility to secure all parts of East Africa, including Eastern DRC. And therefore, a decision was made that we need to have two tracks. One is a political track, so that all issues that are in DRC can be brought on the table and be discussed. And the second one was the military track, where you are going to deploy a regional force that would look at some of the challenges and rebels in Eastern DRC. And those two trucks are operational. As we speak, 
um, when the troops or the countries, the troops contributing countries, that is uh, Uganda, Kenya, South Sudan, and Burundi, have already deployed troops in Eastern DRC. What does that tell you? That is in compliance with the decision that was made by, by the heads of states. And therefore, any remarks that uh, that uh, that uh, that we that that, that pack and go I have not received any form of communication as a secretary general to the effect and I want to believe that if there is any communication then that will be discussed at a very high level at the summit <coughs> level by the way so let us honestly respect also members of the summit in their own right because I know they're in charge of this situation and I'm very confident uh, that they are working on it they are discussing among themselves and uh, there is no official communication that I've received that says that the troops should uh, leave. Or really they are in uh, Eastern DRC. But yeah. uh, if the troops are able to stabilize Eastern DRC, yeah. because it is believed that the DRC uh, military has a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. it, it, it is one thing to stabilize militarily, but it's another to have effective governance there. And, and you see, that is why they, it was decided by the summit that there are two trucks the military truck and political truck. And the political truck is to allow and give a platform where all the groups could sit on a table and discuss, what, discuss whatever issues that they are facing. And that is what we call political truck. And military truck is now the truck that would throw out some of those uh, negative forces that would not be able to comply. And therefore, once that st part of East Africa, which is Eastern DRC, is stabilized, you know how to come with a lot of benefits. One, people of Eastern DRC will be able to live in peace. Number two, that part of um, uh, Eastern DRC, we shall be able, and all the countries will be able to, to support. The people of Eastern DRC will be able to move freely to their neighbors. Remember, Eastern DRC neighbors, uh, South Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and even Tanzania. So people will be able to freely do their business and continue with their normal life as usual. And that is the intention. The intention is to pacify that region so that we can allow the people of Eastern DRC live in harmony and in peace. And that is why the summit of the heads of state decided, let us all work together as a team to resolve this issue. So where, where was the summit of the heads of state when Kampala and Kigali were not on talking terms? In fact, that was an embarrassment and a scar to the East African community. And, 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 you and see, for, for years. Yeah, and can I tell you something? That uh, that is something we must confirm is behind us. And you appreciate this. And in any situation, you'll always find uh, uh, we'd always find a, sin a scenario one or two. But the question is, is there a willingness to resolve? Yes, there is willingness to resolve. Did the leaders go even a mile further to say, let us resolve and move forward? Yes, they did. Look at the proximity between Uganda and Rwanda. And the brothers are now people in the, in, the, in the mix and mix among themselves. So I must say, we should be actually congratulating the leadership to have felt the, that and they went ahead and resolved those issues. And those are issues that are behind ourselves now. You know, I, I keep bringing those examples because I just want to see the glue that brings us together. W when it is threatened or it is shaky, that's why I point it out. Because I also remember in, yeah. Tanz in Tanzania, yeah. uh, you know, some uh, Ugandan herdsmen, uh, we called them Balaro, mm. were chased in northern Tanzania. Mm. And, and even some of them, their cows had to be confiscated there. And, and, and that's from yeah. a country where oh, the whole East Africa is actually anchored. And you know, that's what I keep on uh, saying, that whenever there is a scenario, a scene, one or two, that does not defeat the bigger picture. And the bigger picture here is an integrated East Africa, where if you come, for example, you go to Tanzania yourself, People will think you are Tanzanian. They will not make a difference between you and a Tanzanian, or you and a Kenyan, or you and a, somebody from Rwanda or Burundi. And so what we are saying is just one people, same people, whom demarcations were put by the colonial masters for their own interest. But basically we are one people. And what the leaders we are trying to do is to say, come on, we were one people. We need to continue being one people. Let us live together. That's very true because where I come from in the western part of Uganda, yeah. people who speak my language, which is Rotoro, yeah. are many more in Congo uh -huh. than we are Precisely. in Uganda. If you go to Kigali, to <laughs> Rwanda, the DRC, they'll think you are Congolese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Dr. Peter Mathuki, we're going to take a break and on the spot, we'll mm. be right back. Thank you.
Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is Honorable Dr. Peter Mathuki, the Secretary General of the East African Community. You know, the, another thing I wanted to know was, uh, why can the East African Community pull resources and build the public infrastructure? You know, the seven of you, you could build railways, you could build, uh, um, you know, even the, the, the airlines. You don't have to have so many because most of them are not even making money. Mm. Wh wh where is the initiative together to build the infrastructure that can run the East African economy? In um, last year, we had uh, a summit of mm -hmm. the heads of state in Arusha. Yes. And uh, in that summit, some of the discussions were, that were done were around how do we enhance our infrastructure? that would go in line to promote the common market protocol because common market protocol yes. is about movement of people. People will be able to move if there's enough infrastructure. And three things were discussed. One of them is one area network. One network area yes. is how do we make it is the, the calls or the data become cheaper for, for people and even for business because that once it goes down it facilitates business and this is something already we've started yeah. and uh, if you look at now the calls between the, for example even Uganda and Kenya or Rwanda they have gone slightly lower uh, other countries we are still to onboard them so that when you are calling any partner state within East Africa it's like you're making a local call and that way to be able to make it easier for people to call but also do business but the second issue is about um, the open skies and the need to of cheaper uh, transport system, airline transport system within East Africa. Because currently we looked at the data and information we found. Flying from Burundi to Arusha, you have to go via sometimes Addis Ababa. And the air ticket alone could be even be more expensive than going even to Europe. Or now when you are flying from DRC Kinshasa to East Africa, it's very expensive. So we said, why can't we come together, make the, t the rates lower, and see how we could make it easier for people to move using uh, the, the airlines. And that would be able to, able to support even movement of goods, but also people. And so we are calling our, 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 the regulators, the, the people who are the operators themselves, who are the running airlines. How could you come together? And this meeting will be in July to see how they could come together, sit down with them and government and private sector and see how we can now make the because transport the, the easy. Fact because that is Dr. That Mathuki, the fact is, apart from maybe Ethiopia, mm. all the regional airlines all are yeah. making losses. Correct. And, and, and one wonders, why do we have Burundi Air, Air Rwanda Air, Uganda, Uganda yeah. Airlines and mm. Kenya? And, and these are just, there's a hemorrhage of public resources yeah. in an, an enterprise that is actually taking away, sucking money, yet we could do have come together and together. have one robust airline. In fact, our proposal to them was that how could they come together and come up, come up with a common platform? For example, let's say you are going to the uh, East Asia market, China. We have Air Uganda Airlines, for example. Go bring goods for the entire East Africa. And upon reaching Entebbe, let now the local airlines pick goods from Entebbe to Kigali, to Nairobi, to Dar es Salaam. Give Dar es Salaam and uh, ta Air Tanzania another market, let's say Middle East. Give Kenya with Europe. Give uh, Rwanda here another market like Southern Africa or any other market. And they work together. And this is something that we are discussing with them. However, there's been a challenge of, of course, each one of them feeling we want to fly our own flag. And in the course of doing that, of course, they make losses. So this is a discussion that is being done to make it easier. And that, once it is done, we'll be able now to, to promote our infrastructure. But looking at, at our institution, Kasoa, which is based in Entebbe, it's been working, trying to come up with a modernized aviation system within East Africa that would support this. And you'll we'll appreciate during COVID, Kasoa was able to be very supportive in coming up with measures, especially health measures within our airports. And in fact, in Nairobi, they are creating what we call the Center for Aviation Medicine of its own kind. It's the only aviation medicine we have in Africa, where all the aviation uh, staff and everybody will be getting their certification. And this is something within, within, uh, within East Africa. Coming to the railway, you've seen already that some efforts that are being done with SGR running from Mombasa via Nairobi. And the dream, the initial dream, is to have that uh, uh, regional railways uh, that standard railway engage run to Kampala and then it goes to Kigali or South Sudan and then another one running from Dar es Salaam to possibly Burundi Kigali DRC and the idea is to have a network or railway network because there's already a master plan that would support this and it becomes very easy that you can do business in Nairobi 
and the same day spend your night in, uh, in, uh, in Kampala, and that is possible. So those are the tasks we have given our experts to start coming up with, a, with a, um, a clear roadmap for now we need to boost infrastructure. But the road network, I think some efforts have been done, looking at how the roads have been done for the last uh, few years. We must appreciate that's a good progress in terms of road uh, network and, and connectivity. Already in so East Africa, we are doing <coughs> a road coming from um, Tanzania through Mutukula to, to Uganda, to Kampala, and already connecting Tanzania and Burundi, connecting, uh, of course, the, again, Mombasa, uh, Malaba to Kampala. So road network, some progress is being made, but we are still not there. When it comes to energy, um, because uh, energy is important, yeah. I, I wonder, we have seen uh, Ethiopia develop their grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam mm -hmm. that has the capacity to produce about 6,000 megawatts of power. But mm -hmm. there is another huge potential mm -hmm. o on the River Congo mm -hmm. that could Inga actually, Dam. in the Inga Dam, mm -hmm. that could actually supply almost the entire Africa. Uh, are, yeah. are there plans to be able to build, to generate power on the Congo, on the River Congo, in fact, to expand the Inga Dam? Yeah, actually, we've been working as East African community very closely with the African Union and particularly on infrastructure on how we can make uh, use of Inga Dam that would generate a lot of power and already plans are very ad advanced already we have identified people would come and look at it and see what is the cost implication the African Development Bank already is assessing some of the projects and once that is done then Inga Dam should be able to supply power for the entire Africa and live alone in East Africa. So this is something in our priority and working closely with the African Union, African Development Bank, to make sure we make f uh, full potential. But however, in uh, East Africa, yes, power continues to be slightly expensive, and this is, some, this, this is a reality. Uh, but again, looking at the conference that is just ending today, we've been talking of how, what are the alternative methods of generating power. And uh, already we, we are aware that in uh, Uganda, discovery of oil is a big, is a big thing. And the pipeline that ra will be running from now, Uganda, all the way to Tanzania, is something we all embrace and we need to support. Looking at Kenya with their, their ge geothermal power and looking in Tanzania with the natural gas, I think we are making some progress. And in a few years, it becomes be very easy to address the issue of uh, power, which will then become a very big boost. You know, we can, we can build those dams in Uganda, in mm. Congo, and other yeah. parts, but you also have to remember, it is dependent on the hydrology. It is dependent on the environment. There's a serious depletion yeah. of the forest cover in yeah. Uganda, mm. and ultimately those rivers will run out of water mm. if the environment is destroyed. I wonder whether there's a master plan of the East African community on protecting the environment. As we speak right now, the major road that feeds uh, Uganda to the DRC, to Rwanda, to yeah. Burundi, Masaka and Barara, mm. has been has had a challenge. A flood has, has been flooded in parts of Masaka. Why? Because the environment has been destroyed, the, 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 the road is, is cut off in some parts, and that's a huge challenge. We are facing an existential threat as a people of East Africa because we're not taking care of our environment. In fact, I call upon East Africans to appreciate that climate change is real. You've realized for the last few years, we've been receiving a shortage of rains. Now rains have come. They are plenty and, as you really said, destroying. It's because of how we are taking care of our environment and nature, which I truly appreciate. Looking at our own uh, strategy plan for 2021 to 2026, climate change and food security remains very cardinal. And therefore, what we are saying is that we are even going further to encourage every planting of trees at a times like this so that we can protect our environment. Already we have started feeling that climate change is brought about by how we are the environment is being um, affected, cutting down the trees, etc. But I, I think, again, with awareness and involvement of all stakeholders, the people, the government, the private sector, we can drive this. And again, this is not only affecting East Africa, it's affecting the entire world. Remember, even the effects of climate change that we are facing in East Africa, some of the effects are not even coming from East Africa. They are coming from out far away, where we are even not part of that. But, and but, therefore, but, what we are calling, what we are seeing to do is protect our Mr. environment. Mr. Secretary General, yeah. for Ugandans, 95 percent or more of those who are going to have supper tonight if they are likely to have supper yeah. that supper will have been prepared either using charcoal yes. or wood yes by uh, fuel and that is not sustainable obviously and that's why we are saying um, and that could be the same case in kenya and the same case in tanzania in, and indeed in that entire africa and that's why we are saying now given our environment 
and even using the solar and alternative uh, sources of energy. This is something that we could explore and say, why can't we start not taking advantage of our environment, our weather patterns in East Africa, and say, instead of now using uh, charcoal or those kind of things, let's now thinking and going solar, because solar is more sustainable. Solar is free. All over Africa, we have enough solar that can even power what we do and so forth. So what we, sh what we are telling the private sector is to work closer with government and government to regulate to ensure that we can uh, provide enough solar power that would be able to power not only our homes, but also even most of the, most of the factories and it is possible. And that's what we are saying. Green uh, energy is the way to go. It's more sustainable. You know, we have member states of the East African region belonging to different uh, common uh, mm. markets, mm. Uh, trade, trade zones, for mm. example, the East African uh, community mm. market, mm. and then you have Tanzania is in SADAC, mm. you, you have Congo is also in SADAC. I wonder how these can are harmonized. You see, at the end of the day, the, what you are looking for is a very, is one Africa. Is when you talk of regional integration, we need one strong African continent with a population of 1.5 million people billion. and billion people, 1.5 billion people. Uh, currently, the GDP is slightly lower because it's 3.5 trillion US dollars. And uh, if we're taking advantage of now the African continent of free trade area, then the regional economy blocks becomes building blocks to the regional integration at the continental level. And therefore, the idea of having strong regional eco economic blocks is the way to go. And therefore, one partner said belonging to one or two regional economic blocks. At the end of the day, we shall converge at some point and say we have a very strong uh, African continent. And that is the idea. So that when we are talking with Americans, because they say they're Americans, we're talking to them at that level, where we say now we have a very strong Africa. So regional economic blocks, eight of them in Africa, they become building blocks to our regional integration at the continental level. And therefore, that I don't see is a, is a big problem. There could be administrative issues here and there. But we are working very closely as the eight regional economic blocks to compare notes and see who has what comparative or competitive advantage and see how to push the idea of integrated Africa forward. You know, the problem is that Africa has not been trading with herself. Africa is trading more with the other world, outside world than herself. And, mm. and, and recently, something called the Africa Continental Free Trade Area mm -hmm. was launched in Kigali. Yeah. We are creating one maybe trading yes, block across yes. the continent. Yeah. But even up to today, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area is not running like it should. Yeah, it's even though many people have ratified it. Yes, true. Um, and we must appreciate that our countries in East Africa have already ratified um, the African Continental Free Trade Area. And I tell you, if we take advantage of African uh, free trade area, that's a game changer for us in Africa. Because we have enough natural resources. The value of resources we have within East Africa, natural resources, is to the tune of 50 trillion US dollars. That is two times the GDP of the United States. That is almost like um, three times the GDP of uh, China. And therefore, if East Africa alone, the wealth that is in East Africa, the natural resources, is to tune of that. What about entire Africa? Once it is fully exploited and we take advantage of that, then Africa becomes the next factory of the world where people will be coming for all manner of raw material. So I see a situation that if we take advantage and work together as African continent, then African continent will be driving the world going forward. And that's why I feel the African continent of free trade area is at the initi initial stages of its formation, making the framework and the procedures right. Already we have seen some um, countries who have done exports of uh, coffee, tea, and to experiment to Ghana. We have seen Kenya do that and Rwanda do that. And that is now we are saying that is the way to go. We must not give up. We must not say a baby is born yesterday and the baby must work today. We give it a bit of time, but we all work together looking at the future. We seem to be taking baby steps in perpetuity. <laughs> 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 Our teething problems are not any. <laughs> no. Because without infrastructure, yeah. um, uh, in transport infrastructure, Correct. Africa yeah. cannot trade with herself. Correct. I, I totally agree. For example, when you want to move goods from East Africa, going to Central Africa, you have to go through Atlantic. And it is very possible to say from Kenya, Uganda, and you go to Central, Af uh, Central Republic. And therefore we are saying infrastructure is key, is very important. And looking at the priority of Af uh, priority, key priorities of African Union, 
infrastructure becomes key. And even ourselves at East Africa, priority is also infrastructure because for, for infrastructure facilitates uh, trade of ease of doing business. It makes easy for people to move across and without infrastructure it is impossible. So I, I agree with you that it's, it's important that we focus and invest in uh, infrastructure. And that remains a priority in East Africa. It remains a priority in African Union. And working together it becomes easy. Next week we'll be meeting with the, with the African Development Bank to discuss some of our priority projects in infrastructure to start seeing how do we start moving. So every longest journey begins with a single step that steps have been taken. We are moving. Are we all converted towards that regional integration the way to go? I think so. And so that to me is very important. There is a, uh, Uganda is building a pipeline, an yeah. oil pipeline from yeah. Hoima to yeah. Tanga in Tanzania. Yeah. And, and Tanzania is on board, the East African community is on board. But our oil is coming to the market when the world is transitioning from fossil fuel. Uh, uh, you know, what a bad time for us, no, no, for, for Africa. You see, let me tell you something. That is a natural resource that we have. And what they are doing and the delays that you can see with these, some of these projects because of including uh, you know, foreign uh, players, they want to delay us so that we don't take advantage of this. I think what we need to do is to embrace. And all of us collectively look for funding and resources to make sure that the East African Kurud oil pipeline that comes from Oima to Tanga op operates. Look at the impact of it. That is what will even power and generate enough resources to transition from that to the next level. But we have to start from somewhere. And I think that is the way to go. But it's also possible that we could do face a lot of challenges from those who would maybe would want to keep us where we are. And you see now that I'm saying there must be determination by all of us as East Africans, because what we are saying, we want regional and local solution to our local problems. When you start now benchmarking a problem like that, with what is happening in the rest of the, uh, the, the world, it becomes unfortunate. So I think what we should do is let us not agree to be kept, you know, at, at bay, at the, le at the ground level by those players. Let us all move together. Let's mobilize the resources together to make sure that this project becomes operational. And I think that's the way to go. It is possible. So I can see the, the, the region that began with three states, Tanzania, yeah. Kenya, and Uganda, yeah. has now seven states. Yeah. And I uh, understand the Republic of Federal Republic of Somalia yes. has applied to join. Yes. And Sudan had applied earlier. Yeah. You seem to be doing some charm offensive to <laughs> Ethiopia. <laughs> no, yeah, correct. And, and Djibouti. And, uh, so where do you envisage uh, th this I, region I, I to go? I, I see, and if uh, East Africans allow and agree, that the way to go is to have a bigger and stronger regional economic block of close to 500 million people. And this will be possible if we can have all the countries in the eastern, eastern region join a regional economic block. We should have Somalia already, we have done a verification mission to Somalia, and we have gotten a report which we have circulated to all the partner states to review and give their views. So that in the subsequent meetings of the heads of states, they could look at the report and uh, determine uh, the admission of Somalia. And once Somalia joins, that becomes the eighth member of the East African community. And we look, we look forward and to Ethiopia, Ethiopia with a market population of 120 million people. That becomes a big, big for us. Even Sudan, and we're really sorry for what is happening because it's not our interest to see Africans fighting among themselves. And I'm happy that uh, our heads of state have interve are intervening to make sure that they stabilize Sudan. At the time they had applied, they had applied to become members of the East African community, even far earlier before South Sudan. But because one of the criteria is that you have to be a, be a, a, a neighbor member, a neighbor, geographically a neighbor to an existing member, then Sudan could not qualify that particular time. Now they qualify. So having all this block and Djibouti, this regional economic block, I am telling you, we'll be having a market of 500 million people. So that when we do our own business, we produce our own food, our milk, our eggs, you are comfortable that you can sell that within this block without any issues. And that is the way to go. I encourage East Africans that let us embrace this. And I think, I, I feel 
the Nkaranta in this is our Mzee, is our his excellence president Museven because he's been saying the bigger the market, the good for us in East Africa. And good for our survival. And good for survival. It's so basic that we need all this. So I think uh, that is the way to go. Is uh, not about term offensive, it's about being real so that we can compete in the world today. And I started by saying if we have those kind of numbers and go and say encourage investors to come to Kampala, invest here. Come and put your factory here, a vaccine factory here, and access the 500 million people. That is the way to go. That is going to impact on our welfare. It's going to impact on the, the revenue collection for our countries, and the GDP of our countries will increase. We are going to create jobs, and we become steady in the global arena. And I think that's the way to go. So we are trading to, together to a tune of about $12 billion? Yeah, now closely now we are intra-trade within East Africa close to $12 billion. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, that is still small considering it's, it's what the potential is. Yeah, but you see the fact is that we are not going down, we are increasing. So the trajectory, we are increasing. And I see a situation now with the good now weather and stuff like that. It becomes easy. We are trying to resolve most of the non-tariff barriers that have been existing so that we can open. And once DRSC is fully integrated into East Africa and their borders are open, DRSC population is close to 100 million people. And what they are doing is they are taking 30% of what they consume come from China. What we are selling currently to DRSC is 11%, 11 to 13% of what they consume comes from East Africa collectively. And therefore, once they get fully integrated, we'll be able now to overtake and now the inter trade within East Africa will go possibly to almost 30, 40 percent. Currently, we are doing at around 20 percent. You know, something back, there was a study, you know, uh, research that was done asking the East African people on coming together what um, their worries, and some of them were worried about uh, Kenya, uh, the, the, the country where yourself you're born. They, think, yes. they thought, I mean, the Kenyans will, will <laughs> you know, come and and, and overtake, overrun everything else. Though in actual sense that has not even been the case. Mm. But what are the other fears? Because you see, look at it this way. To date, United States, which is one of the biggest countries in the world, they still give green cards to encourage people to go there. And therefore they take advantage of the best brains. So there is no fear whatsoever if we are one nation called East Africa, where we are able to share ideas and expertise within East Africa. And therefore the fear that uh, one country will take advantage or better than the other. And founded, I give you an example. The trade, the balance of trade between Kenya and Uganda in the last two years, you, it was almost coming at par. Yes. Actually Uganda being ahead of Kenya. Tanzania currently is trading with Kenya, balance of trade favors Tanzania than Kenya. So it's not a, it was a fear that were not really founded. But the more we trade and become used to one another, the more we become. Because it's an open market. It's a market-driven uh, integration. And therefore, whoever is able now to produce enough, you'll be able to sell enough because you have ready market. So it's not about fears. It's about how do we start embracing. Before these boundaries that came, that were put by our colonial masters, were we not living together? If you go to eastern uh, uh, Uganda, and Western Kenya. You didn't make a difference between the people living either side of the border. Actually, you find one family is on this side, the other family is on the other side, and they're the same people. Actually, what I can, I can give you a vivid example. Mm. Uh, when uh, the Awori family, when, uh -huh. when Muda Awori yes. was vice president in Kenya, Precisely. his uh, brother, <laughs> young brother, yeah. was running for president in Uganda. Precisely. <laughs> and this is one family. And that is what Masai in Namanga uh, do. Masai, you find there's a family this side and a family the other side. So if you tell them they don't move, is there's no fears. We are one people. Today, East today, is today one the people. deputy CDF or chief of defense forces in Congo yeah. is a man called Charlie Gonza. Yeah. <laughs> that general yeah. is a, a, a guy who we share the same dialect. Please uh, the, the guy, another in, 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 in Congo is called Mbusa Nyamwisi. He is a guy also who shares another dialect with a, a Ugandan community. And, and, and is in charge of uh, we, and affairs that, in Kinshasa. And that's why I say we are one people. But again, our people from outside, they come and divide us and tell us, you are this country, you are this nationality, you are this nation. But we are the same people. Me and you, if you compare, we are brothers. I mean, what's the difference? And therefore, the feeling of their fears from one country to the other is unfounded. 
and what I would want to encourage East African, let us embrace East African community, regional integration, remain one people, and take advantage and grow our own community. No one else will come. We don't expect uh, foreigners to come from wherever to come and develop our region. It is ourselves, and therefore there must be a collective responsibility and ownership of this community and drive the community to, together Mr. Forward. Secretary General, when you are in the marble the corridors of Arusha, yeah. you know, with your colleagues and, um, you know, talking good English and making sense, <laughs> <laughs> there's sometimes there could be a possibility that you are making sense to yourselves <laughs> the people are left behind in some way. I, I, I know, and I, that's why you, you look at for the last two years, since we were given this opportunity to serve, we have tried much as possible to do activities in all the partner states. Today, this now, today, yesterday, the day before, we were doing this uh, uh, petroleum conference in Kampala. And I'm sure many people from Uganda have known mm -hmm. East Africa what we are doing. In December last year, we did the SMEs, uh, Juakali sector here in Kampala. We had uh, the court of the East African Court of Justice last year come here and sit here. We had our games of East Africa Legislative Assembly in, uh, in Juba. We had assembly sitting in Kigali. We had our Council of Ministers and so many meetings happening in um, Expo in Bujumbura and so is in Kenya. The idea is to take activities closer to the people. That is now taking the community closer to the people so that the people understand the benefits they continue appreciating. But uh, in terms of policy, and that's why I said, when we shall be having in all the countries a national ID as the only document that you need to use for travel, it becomes easy. When we shall be able now to say, now you have qualified mendi, me, doctor or engineer and you can walk and do business in Kenya or in Tanzania or in DRC without anything, then it becomes it. And those are some of the things we are working on so that now uh, as an East African we can walk in any of the partner states, you will put your business there, you buy your land or work there. And it becomes easy. And that's you know, what I'm saying. I'm talking about of course, the business. You know what is happening today? In fact, yeah. he, before I came in here, I, I, I met a friend of mine who had an issue. I said, you know what? There's a problem in East Africa, the migration of unskilled labor. Yeah. You know, y y young people who are ex more or less exported to do slavery mm. in the Middle East mm. in big numbers. And, mm. and, and they're running because there are no opportunities here. And when they go there, some of them have made money. Yes, others have had gory stories to tell. And you know what we are saying now with uh, our East African community. Now we, uh, we can say we are s almost six million square kilometers. Huge land, which we could even use, and instead of having our people go to Middle East and other parts, let us do farming in East Africa, because it is possible now we have enough land. Let us embrace what we have and create awareness among our young people that even with agriculture, that you can still make a lot of money than going to do a job somewhere in Middle East to get mistreated away. You get land, we have all this big, huge chunk of land in East Africa. Let us now say, agriculture is our backbone as the East Africans. Could we start encouraging our youth to understand agriculture? And even I encourage our institutions of learning, even from the lowest primary, start teaching kids understanding agriculture and the beauty of agriculture, because that is what's more sustainable than teaching kids on how to get white-collar jobs that are not even sustainable. So I think we need to be to appreciate that we have enough resources within our region. Yeah, but enough resources, are, if I just look, shed a light on East African community itself, you, you are actually it's largely funded by, the, by the, uh, the donor community. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and, and that is sad. And that is very unfortunate because, again, some of the big projects that can transform our economies, you know, our donors will always come and they find a way of slowing them down. And therefore, when we are talking of now local solutions to our local problems, is the way to go. We need to start now devising our methods of saying, we have market, we have enough land, the climate and weather in East Africa is good. Could we start now working around and taking advantage of this? Are you optimistic? I think that is a way to go and very optimistic. And I invite all East Africans to say, this is our region and no one else will come and develop it. It's ourselves. Dr. Mathoki, what's going to be your concluding remark tonight? That I want to thank um, East Africans uh, from across all the partner states for appreciating that East African community belongs to them. And I want to inform you that it is people-centered. <coughs> it's your community. Give your views, your remarks, your feedback on how we feel we need to drive this community. And I think the way to go 
is when we are together, we are strong. We want to see a strong East Africa of more than 500 million people, and that's my vision. That will be able to sit on the table in the global arena and compete and discuss issues that benefit our people in East Africa. And I think that is where to go. Dr. Peter Mathoki, Secretary General of the East African Community, I want to thank you so much for the time you've given us, for the value you've added on our platform, for having visited Uganda. And by the way, you could even stay in Kampala. Uganda is a place where sometimes... <laughs> by, by the way, you need to know, my two sisters are married in Uganda, one in Masaka and one in Tororo. Ah. And therefore, Uganda is home. <laughs> ah, you're, you're, you're indeed home. <laughs> Dr. Mathoki, I want to thank him thank so much. You. He's a man who's so passionate about the East African community. He's so optimistic that's going to work. And this is not blind optimism. <laughs> he has the figures and numbers that can show this can work. And I'm sure if we build this uh, as East Africans, you know, there's no doubt. Uh, Africa Mashariki Nijietu, let's build it. Good night and God bless you again. Thank you.